Hey everybody, Carrie Champion here with Stephen A, co-host co of First Take. Um, Stephen A, we're, we're talking about this. I tried to say it was like trading places. David Lloyd said that's not the, the, the same. Um, who wins in this trade with Kyrie to Boston and Isaiah to Cleveland? Well, the first thing that's important to say is that there are no losers. Okay. Boston picked up a star in Kyrie Irving. His brother's big time. Uh, he's a scoring machine. He's got the nastiest handle in the game. Um, he can score on anybody, average 25 points a game, and more importantly, he can close. LeBron was not the closer for the Cleveland Cavaliers. That would happen to be Kyrie Irving. So you got somebody like that who's a bigger, stronger version to some degree of Isaiah Thomas. Paired in Boston with Gordon Haywood, clearly the Boston Celtics are better today than they were yesterday. But I still think that there's a slight edge that goes to, Bo to Cleveland in terms of who got the better end of the deal. In Cleveland, you got a guy by the name of Isaiah Thomas who averaged nearly 29 a game, who was a candidate for league MVP honors, who's a scoring machine in his own right, and he did that without LeBron James as his teammate. So having LeBron James as his teammate, even though the numbers were doing to some degree because you have somebody you're deferring to as opposed to you being the man, you're still going to end up benefiting and being better because of it. So you've got Isaiah Thomas, you've got Drake, uh, Jay Crowder, who can ball. He's better than serviceable. He's a really good player, solid on both ends of the floor, capable of spelling for LeBron, being on the court with LeBron and taking the toughest defensive assignment where LeBron doesn't have to, et cetera, et cetera. That helps. And then after that, of course, you've got a first-round pick that's unprotected, that's coming from the Brooklyn Nets, who everybody expects to be sorry. Right. Uh, they're on the come up with Sean Marks and those boys. They'll be fine eventually, but you don't expect anything from them this year. So that draft pick is expected to be high. All those things considered, look at what Cleveland has done in the offseason. You got Derrick Rose. You got, uh, uh, you know, Jeff Green. Yeah. You got Jeff Green. Now you got Crowder and Isaiah Thomas. So you got at least three new starters, possibly four, and you lost one. You have more depth. You have more talent because of it, and you still keep LeBron James. That means a win for Cleveland. Okay, so nobody's a loser, though, in your opinion. Nobody's a loser. But, but you'd say if you had to give the edge to somebody, it'd be to Cleveland yes. in terms of the deal. Yes. So now, so with that being said, uh, is there more pressure on Kyrie or LeBron? LeBron. Why? As far as I'm concerned, because uh, LeBron is about championships, it's about the chip. All Kyrie has to do is get back to Boston. With all the noise that's being said, Kyrie never uttered out of his mouth that he was better than LeBron James. Okay. He never made the statement that I think the team should be mine, not his, because of talent. He might have felt that way because he was willing to commit, whereas LeBron was up in the air as to whether he would stay or go long term. But that's about it. Everybody knows that LeBron James, the only player in the world considered on his level is uh, three guys, as far as I'm concerned, mm -hmm. Kevin Durant, uh, Kawhi Leonard, and Anthony Davis. Outside of that, there's nobody on LeBron's level. He's the best in the world, and it is what it is. So if you're Kyrie Irving and you go to Boston with Gordon Haywood, who can ball, by the way, you get back to the Eastern Conference Finals, you've done your part. In the case of LeBron James, you're one and three in the last four NBA Finals. You could have easily been 0 and four in the last NBA Finals. On top of that all, you're the best player in the world. You have a champion roster and the team that's standing in your way the Golden State Warriors particularly with the acquisition of Kevin Durant is somebody that when you were asked about after winning the Eastern Conference Finals against Boston you literally said on national television I really don't want to answer that question right now I don't want to address them it was just too stressful I want right. to enjoy this moment right. so one would argue that you walked into the NBA Finals with a defeatist attitude basically knowing that you were going to lose right now that this is this talent on the squad has been upgraded even though Golden State is still my favorite and practically everybody's favorite there is no doubt that Cleveland got better okay. there is no doubt that Cleveland can compete and if you can compete based on your roster and it's led by the greatest player in the world that means there are no excuses which puts the pressure on LeBron more so than Kyrie in okay. my opinion so then wait let's talk about this relationship and then in your in your opinion when, when when the news broke that Kyrie asked for a trade or wanted a trade did you think it would happen before the season I didn't know uh, it was because all the it was all contingent on what Cleveland would be able to get for him you knew the Knicks wanted him and were willing to unload Carmelo not Porzingis you knew the Phoenix Suns wanted him but were unwilling to unload Josh Jackson okay that wasn't going to happen so you started scouring the league and you knew that Danny Ainge was holding on to those picks and people in Boston were basically saying you're doing all of this for once for what exactly at some point you got to pull the trigger mm -hmm. you got to go for it Danny Ainge and he seemed reluctant to do so because he didn't acquire Jimmy Butler when he could have acquired Jimmy Butler and had Jimmy Butler 
and Gordon Haywood in Boston. And then a lot of people would have said, hey, maybe Boston could take Cleveland. So when he wasn't willing to do that, you didn't know what he would do as it pertained to Kyrie. But ultimately, give Danny credit where the credit is due. He's been an exceptional executive over the last several years in piecing this team together. The hiring of Brad Stevens was an absolutely brilliant move because the man can coach. And now look who you have. You got Gordon Haywood. Now you got Kyrie. You got two cornerstones of your franchise along with a really, really good coach leading the way. And so when you look at it from that perspective, I just say to myself, hey, it is what it is. Boston's going to be there. Boston's going to make some noise. It'll come down to them in Cleveland again. So what about LeBron congratulating Kyrie? The classy thing to do. I expected him to do that. Do you think that they can make amends or the friendship is on, on a minute? Like, or is it just, is, it, that's done? <sighs> you hear different things. A lot of it is about basketball. Some of it is about off the, off the court stuff that's none of our business. And I'm certainly not about to get into that. What I would tell you is this. Kyrie is a calm, cool, collected individual. He has his moments. Sure. But for the most part, he's a grown-up, and he doesn't get caught up in too much pettiness. LeBron James is all about his business. Mm -hmm. He's about being the greatest in the world, recognized for it, and manufacturing that into business opportunities for himself. That is LeBron James. And so when you look at it from that perspective, are they adult enough to be cordial and civil with sure. one another? Of course. But at the same time, LeBron being classy, well, he personifies class. Right. He usually takes the high road. He's very, very big on publicly taking a position that is the high road. Now, privately is a different matter. <laughs> but publicly, <laughs> he always <laughs> takes the high road. So some people would say it's disingenuous, phony, or whatever the case may be. But give credit where credit is due. Right. He usually says and does the right things because he's about his business and to engage himself in anything else would compromise his business, and he's never about doing that. This matchup between the two, what happens when we see them play together? Cleveland in six. Last year, they took out Boston in five. This year, they'd win an extra game. Kyrie would be good enough for that. But ultimately, LeBron is on the other side, and there's nobody in the Eastern Conference that is equipped to beat him. Al Horford, Gordon Haywood, and Kyrie Irving ain't going to be enough to knock off LeBron James, especially with Isaiah Thomas, who can score on anybody looking for a new contract deal that's going to make him in about $177 million or $130 million, depending on whether he stays in Cleveland or goes elsewhere. He wants to get paid. He has to perform in order to do that. And now you've got your sidekick is LeBron James, yeah. the greatest in the world. I cannot see Boston making too much noise this particular season. Beyond this season, I think things are going to get interesting. If, Bo if LeBron leaves Cleveland, then the conference belongs to Boston. But until that time, this year, I would give Boston an extra game Cleveland would take them out in six instead of five, and then Cleveland will go to the finals and lose again to Golden State. <laughs> As constructed currently. Uh, meanwhile, you got to get out of here because you're going to Vegas. You, uh, first take is at the fight, during the fight Thursday, Friday. Well, we got a sp we got the show tomorrow, then yeah. we got a primetime special tomorrow night, Okay. Uh, uh, 5 o'clock West Coast time, sure. 8 p.m. Eastern time, and then Friday we're doing the show as well, Mayweather McGregor. Plus, we'll be back there in a few weeks for Con Canelo versus Triple G. I, it's, it's a good time for boxing. You see Oscar De La Hoya in the back. It's a very good time. All right. It's a very good time. We are done. Stephen A. Smith giving his take on what happened yesterday.